Hey friends, welcome back to Beer and Beauty, it's Kasha. Today's beer of the day is uh, something I recently picked up and uh, it's called uh, Ila Vila. Ila Vanilla? Ila Vanilla, yeah, that must be it. Ila Vanilla from Full, Full Circle Brewing Company. It's a milkshake IPA and it's 6.5% and it's from Fresno, California, so I'm not too far away. And the first thing I was attracted to it was um, the fact that it's a milkshake IPA and it's got this cool skull on an ice cream cone. There appears to be some like hops sprouting out of the top of the skull that's a little bit cracked open. And yeah, I've tried milkshake IPAs before. They've got that lactose sugar that it, it makes them delicious. So let's go ahead and give it a taste. Cheers. Mmm. Yum. So good. It's like a delicious dessert. It's still pretty happy. Like, um, I think if you were a tough guy that doesn't like sweet things, you could still really enjoy this. <laughs> a tough guy like me. Yeah, I'm not really a big sweets person, though. Um, something I, I haven't talked to you guys about, actually. I did give up uh, drinking entirely for like over a month back in November. And uh, I did <laughs> replace like beer with ice cream for a little while, so. This is this kind of gives me a little bit of the best of both worlds. It does taste like like an ice cream dessert and it's delicious. It's an IPA and I love IPAs. It's my favorite kind of beer. So this is really amazing and I love it so much. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with this beer. So cheers to that. Today's video is something I'm pretty excited to do, even though it kind of, I've kind of been ramping myself up to this moment because uh, things have been crazy in the world in so many ways all year. All year. Uh, even in the weeks since the new year has happened. But I still feel like it would be a good thing to do this video because, um, well, this is going to be my 2020 favorites. And let's be real, y'all. 2020 has been a big year of pain and hardship and sacrifice and loss and grieving, like all these sad negative emotions. And it's been incredibly challenging to not me, not just me, I think everybody, but it's encouraged us all to become more like stronger, like more like we've adapted to the circumstances to the best of our abilities sometimes you know maybe maybe some of us are still working through the ways in which we've had to adapt our lives i've spent my entire life living in a rapidly changing world but 2020 is like even more rapidly changing than anybody could ever be prepared for right and through all the pain and all the heart heartache there's still a lot of really beautiful things that happened in 2020 my favorites videos, I've, I've done favorites videos on this channel for a long time, and my favorites videos were hardly ever about the traditional, like, context of a YouTube favorites video. Usually people talk about their favorite products, um, like, they're usually pertaining to makeup or whatever their channel happens to be about. And I do talk about that a little bit as well, because I love um, makeup, that's why I have a makeup channel, and that's why I'm a makeup artist. I, I love these things. But uh, as I've kind of been been using this channel as a way to come to terms with my what I want in life and my needs and the things that are setting me back, including my spending, my, my favorites have kind of evolved into something else. And it's been a really good kind of journal of gratitude. My, my word of the year for... 2020. Uh, I, you know, I didn't go into 2020 with the word of the year, but now that I try, I uh, reflect, like in prepare in preparation for this video, I've been kind of reflecting on the year. Uh, I, I try to think about like what were the the con the themes of 2020 for me. Um, what was the word of the year? And I think it's something that kind of evolved. But damn, did I learn so much from this year? And uh, I think gratitude was a big one. Pushing myself to be grateful for things throughout the year really helped me get through the entire year. There's a lot of grief and loss in, that has come out of 2020 for so many people. As long as you're finding anything to be grateful for, whether it's just something as simple as your health, that's an incredibly valuable resource in the, in the age of the pandemic, right? It's a really healthy practice and it helps you keep going and it helps you connect to others, you know, it helps you 
spread compassion for yourself and also for others. Being grateful of the people of your life brings you closer to them. I think that's a good enough introduction. I think you guys know where I'm getting at with this. Um, why I feel like it's important to do this video and I feel like it would be really ben beneficial for me and maybe for whoever might be watching this. So keep on watching if you'd like to hear about some of the things that have kept me going and have made me grateful for being alive in this cold, cruel world <laughs> um, and have gotten me through the year. I wrote down a few things. I, th I, I think I'd like to do this kind of as a free association kind of style video, but I did uh, make a few notes because there's something, there's things I don't want to forget to mention for sure. But you know, now that I'm starting to talk, I'm, come, I'm starting to come up with other things that were really meaningful to me. So let's go ahead and get into it. My 2020 favorites. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, so I, th I have a feeling that I'm gonna like probably cry at some point of this video, so let's go ahead and start with some things that are a little bit more light, a little bit more fun. Even though 2020 was a year where so many things were just shut the F down, even despite all of which, uh, there has been some really incredible art that has come out into the world. And with the newfound time that we had on our hands, I think a lot of us had a lot more time to experience more film and TV and music than I think we ever would before. Plus, for me especially, it's been a strange year because, you know, the, the pain and the cruelty and everything about this cold, cruel world and the mysterious ways in, in which it functions have kind of caused me to regress a little bit. And I, I think that's the truth for so many other people too. Like. I'd like to ask you viewers to re remember being a teenager a little bit. Like everything that you experienced were you were experiencing for the first time and therefore the feelings around those experiences were so raw and so intense. A lot of the same kind of feelings were happening this year because for many of us, we've never experienced a pandemic before. We've never experienced having to put all of our plans for the year just on the back burner in such a massive way. The only solace I think a lot of us had uh, when having to do deal with all these things is knowing that everybody else is going through a version of that thing too, right? And when I was a teenager, I would deal with this cold cruel world by trying to understand it. I would spend hours just in alone in my bedroom reading literature, writing poetry myself, trying to maybe make a like a painting, make crafts, make art, listen to lots of music. I would listen to lots of music, doing whatever I could to soothe myself because I was young, I was 13, 14, and I big time got right back into philosophizing about and trying to understand through my you know, sitting alone in my room thinking ab about why things are going the way that they're going. I'm trying to understand people, trying to understand the world, trying to understand economics, trying to understand the history uh, of uh, inequality in this country and the world. It, it reminded me of the way that I felt when I was that angsty teenager. I got right back into listening to punk music. Like when I was a child, I that was what got me through my teenage years was punk, but also other forms of music. I really uh, began to love music. And the reason that I moved to LA this year was because I also loved film. And I, I was, ex the few films that I was able to see this year, just, I really soaked right in. And I want to talk about those as, with you as well. And also TV, lots of great TV shows came out this year too. Um, so let me go ahead and start talking to you about that. So I rediscovered music big time and I recently I started listening to like punk music while I would go for a run because it, it was actually kind of like pr a productive way of channeling my political anger. <laughs> I would go um, out for a run and uh, try to channel my anger into the run itself. And that was really good for me. It really uh, helped me relax, really analyze the anger. I felt a little bit less alone because I'd be listening to these punk songs like from the Dead Kennedys and from Bad Brains and all these punk bands. And I would philosophize about the, the political things that were happening when those songs were written and what's going on now. And, 
and I really got into it. Um, I also, this year, discovered the music of Anderson Pack. Really incredible artist. Uh, I know, and it's not like, I think he did put out a new album this year. He actually did, a, uh, he put out a great song in response to the protest movement, the Black Lives Matter movement that happened over the summer. Uh, and the music video that went with it was, I, I found to be pretty moving as well. But his blend of noticing uh, the political climate and, as well as mashing it up with um, music, which he's definitely just like a musician. It's a little bit jazzy, a little bit funky, but it's very hip hop. Um, there's a certain amount of rap in there too. Uh, and he is no stranger to rock and roll. He's also a drummer. I first heard his music because he was did a feature on Eminem's new album. And Eminem put out two albums this year, one at the beginning of the year and one at the end of the year. And he uh, did a feature on the song called Lockdown. And I'm just like, damn, this is so funky. This just sounds so cool. And you know, Emin I also love that album from Eminem. Uh, he's a master. The, the way that he can spit is just, uh, unreal, like, but, you know, I guess that comes with the territory when you've been doing it for, oh, what, 20 years? Like, I remember watching Eminem on TRL back when I was, like, seven years old in 1997. I'm a little bit older than his daughter, just a little bit. <laughs> you know, Eminem's work comes in waves. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's a little bit more hot, sometimes it's a little bit more cold. As a diehard fan of Eminem, I always find something to like about him, but... I really especially loved that song, Lock It Up, with Anderson Pack, and that got me really interested in Anderson Pack. and then I discovered his Tiny Desk concert, and I watched that Tiny Desk concert like, like 50 times. I loved it so much. I was just, and it was sad because I d discovered it in the, like, in the beginning stages of lockdown, and, the, and I'm just like, damn, I just want to go to a concert. This is just really making me want to go to a concert big time. So like once everybody's vaccinated or, you know, has acquired immunity in some way, shape or form, and we can start doing concerts again, love to go to an Anderson Pack concert. Like I, I, I can't wait. And another thing that made me really love music and be excited about music was Lady Gaga's new album. Chromatica is so good. And I, I loved it from the first time I heard it. When I first saw the Lady Gaga music video where it's called Stupid Love. I love the colors, the dancing, the choreography, the, it, it's a big ad for the, the iPhone uh, because it was all shot on iPhone and it's, you know, the way that they tried to express the color quality and the way it picks up movement or what have you. It, I guess it was a really, the perhaps the best version of the ad that could have happened for like, for uh, iPhone, but the song was just so catchy and uh, it just made me remember my youth again. Hey friends, I had to uh, set up a different setup because randomly the power socket in the other room stopped working, so I couldn't plug in my ring light into it, so now we're in the breakfast nook. And sadly, I think the sound is not going to be as good, but let's just go ahead and resume and power through this. I th but yeah, I was just talking about Lady Gaga, right? So this new album, I love that it's a resurgence of uh, her electro-pop roots. Uh, like when she first came onto the scene, she was, she was so now. She was so what the moment wanted, right? Uh, it, she just like became an instant hit overnight with her hit Just Dance because it's what everybody wanted. Everybody just, um, the time was ripe for uh, dancing. Like people were going to clubs in a way that they aren't now anymore. Or I don't know where you live, but where I uh, was living last year in Massachusetts, there was just like nowhere to go dancing. And she's back to doing that. She's uh, she's uh, returning to those roots, those electro pop roots. And at the time when she first hit the scene and she became so big so fast, it's like we didn't know that this is the music that we wanted at the time. Like we didn't know that we want so it right. This, hearing this new album is so much of that those feelings, and it makes me just want to go out and dance. And that's another thing that's a little bit sad because you can't go out dancing. And whenever I hear her new album, whether I hear this, the song called Stupid Love, 
the the hit that she did with Ariana Grande, Rain On Me. Uh, my boyfriend didn't quite like that song, but I loved it because it's more of that electropop roots and I've grown to like Ariana Grande this year as well for, you know, uh, different reasons, but this was a great song to do together. And lastly, the music video for 911. My goodness gracious. Uh, not only is she returning to her electropop roots, but she's going back to being weird again, you know? She had her moment of being a country music star for a moment there, and uh, she stopped wearing the meat dresses and doing all the crazy avant-garde ways in which she would push the limits of fashion, I guess you could say. Um, but she went right back into that, and it's even deeper now. I, I loved 911 because it was just so beautiful. The music video was just beautiful to watch. When the first time I saw it, it was really making my imagination churn. I'm just like, what is happening? What am I watching? And then you see the end of the music video and you're just like, oh my god. <sighs> Absolutely mind-blowing. So artistic, so beautiful. She looks so beautiful. She's more beautiful than ever. I love the the mint green hair, even the the washed out pink hair. Uh, the music is just so high energy. It's so Lady Gaga. Uh, her look is there too. You can just feel the 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 love that she has um, for herself, her music, music in general. It's really eye opening, and I just can't wait to get back into the club and go dancing and hear Lady Gaga on the dance floor and to be able to go dancing to some Lady Gaga just like I did back when I was um, 18 in 2008 when Lady Gaga was brand new out on the scene so oh I also changed my mind about Doja Cat like when I first moved to LA you'd only hear two songs you'd hear Juicy by Do Doja Cat or you'd hear that song The Box or like a Drake song and, the, and you just hear like those three songs out on a loop I'm just like God, LA, don't you have any other songs? I thought this is supposed to be the most creative city in the world. Like, where's your where's your music? Then Doja Cat gave us a summer jam with Say So. And it's a good summer, summer jam. Like, it really kind of makes me think of the summer and going kayaking and swimming in the pool. It's great. I It's another well thought out song. And I really loved the 70s vibes. The moment that I really started to fall in love with Doja Cat is just noticing that every time she put out a song, it sounded nothing like the one before. But then you'd watch the music videos and they're, they're pop art. They're very colorful and they're very bright. And she's very comfortable with who she is. And um, that's really inspiring and uh, fun to watch and it seemed like she really did, has a genuine love for music and all different genres too and you can see um, all different genres creep themselves into her music. Uh, yeah, she's just a really good pop star. I, I don't know what, what, what can, I don't know what else to say. Like, And now every time I see Doja Cat do something, it's like I'm excited for it. Recently, back in the fall, she did that performance at the AMAs where she did a metal remix of the song Say So and oh my gosh, I, that blew my mind too. That was so cool. I loved it so much. I've been trying to learn the, the lyrics and it's hard because she both sings and raps in this music video, in this song. So the reason I'm trying to learn it because I think it'd be really fun to go do karaoke and do this song, especially the metal cover or like the metal remix that she did. I feel like that would be a lot of fun, I think. Oh, and I also love uh, Megan Thee Stallion's new album that came out this year. Fell in love with just Megan Thee Stallion's presence and how gangster she is. And she's just the new queen of rap. Like, yeah, she's just so confident. She knows what she likes, she knows what she wants, uh, and I think all oh, that's really inspiring and I really like her music and um, like how unapologetic she is for all that, so. Um, those, that's the music that I've really loved in 2020. Let's talk about um, some TV shows. I feel like I watched more TV shows this year that I really loved, but for some reason the, the, the two ones that really stick out is the first one is Watchmen. I watched Watchmen at the beginning of uh, the quarantine. 
just incredible acting, uh, the way that they reconfigured the storyline of Watchmen because it's a really bizarre storyline if you just take it at face value out of the comics and the movie is very strange now that I think about it. Like um, after watching the, the series, the TV series, I, I realized that they really tried to cram in way too much stuff into the movie and it kind of fall, fell flat for that reason. But with the show you get so much nuance and the way that they reconfigured configured the, the stories to incorporate some history that a lot of people shockingly didn't know about, including myself. And it takes place in like 2019, but it's like a like an alternate universe version of 2019. Still, nonetheless, a lot of the same issues, the, the historical moments that they talked about uh, still face us today. And this, what's really incredible is that, you know, I watched the show before everything happened this summer with the Black Lives Matter movement. So it just kind of spoke to the idea that our world is so nuanced and history just has this way of it repeating itself and hopefully we can learn from it. I don't, I don't know what to say uh, that really kind of sums up my thoughts about it, but I think it's the story and the acting and the drama and it's, a, it's another very big genre bending kind of show. Like it's a little bit of everything. It's very sci-fi, it's very, it's a little bit horror, it's a little bit drama, it's a little bit uh, dystopian future, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit film noir. It's just all these different genres. I think I talked about it in another, I think it was in my June favorites, I talked about um, Watchmen as well and that was an incredible show and I loved it so much. And then I also watched Finnish Lovecraft Country, but another show that I watched this year and loved so much was Lovecraft Co Country. There's many things about Watchmen and Lovecraft Country that intertwine. Lovecraft Country, it's mostly horror, but it's a little bit genre bending too. It's very, a very interesting period piece as well. And I just kept falling in love over and over with one of the characters. Uh, who's the actress who played her? She also played Black Canary in Birds of Prey, which I also saw this year. It was the last movie that I saw in theaters um, ever again. <laughs> um, and I, you know, that's not one of my favorites, but even though there's things that I liked about it, it's just not the most profound, memorable movie I've ever seen in my life. But the actress that was also in Lovecraft Country as well as Birds of Prey, she's incredible in both. Journey Smollett, that's the name of the actress, and she is so beautiful, and she is such a great actress in this movie, or in this uh, TV show. It's another one that's a little bit horror, a little bit sci-fi, a little bit of everything, um, or it's a lot of different things. Incredible period piece, very historical, but it burgeons the question, and I, I do believe Jordan Peele directed it, which Dor Jordan Peele is like one of my new favorite directors. I love everything that he does, everything he touches is just incredible. This new approach to horror is is really compelling and I like that it burgeons this question that's almost kind of campy and you know, but also very real question even though it's a little silly, but what's scarier, monsters or racism? Depends. Depends. <laughs> Depends on the situation, I guess. So I do recommend everybody watch Watchmen and Lovecraft Country. Um, I really enjoyed watching those shows. I really need to finish Lovecraft Country. I, I think I watched like six episodes, but I don't have HBO, so I, I need to like watch it while I'm... I think I'm gonna get HBO, HBO Max because there's just so many shows that I want to see. There's gonna be a new season of Euphoria. Ugh. Anyway. And then movies, some movies that I saw this year that really were some of my favorites. Let's talk about that. I guess I'll go in order of what I saw first. So the first movie that I saw that I really fell in love with that really made me think this year was Parasite. Um, I saw Parasite, I think on Hulu, you can see it. Really deep. This movie was so deep, uh, a little scary. And I forget what his name was, but I know he also directed the movie Old Boy, and he has this very kind of disturbing style that was really kind of visceral, like it really kind of gets underneath your skin. And this movie definitely did that, uh, and it really made, made you think about the economy and power dynamics and the world. And uh, I think I'd like to revisit that movie again because it's been so long since I've seen it. Um, but damn, I, I don't even know how to begin talking about this movie. Like, it's a lot, uh, but in the best way. It re it's really a thinker. It's a re and um, the acting's great. The 
the directing is great. I think the directing is what really makes it so effective. And it did really well in the Oscars, I guess. So yeah, everybody check out Parasite. That one was really great and it has its, it's kind of has its like finger on the pulse of what's going on in our world before everything unfolded. Like this happened at the beginning of the year. So then I watched, was it, I think uh, when I went to spend some time with Mike in Massachusetts, we watched Hamilton on Disney Plus. I loved it. I loved Hamilton on Disney Plus. We kept listening to it on loops because we we drove back and forth across the country so many times. So we were listening to the soundtrack so much, but it really got us interested in American history. Of course, uh, Mike decided to watch John Adams, and I watched it with him, and it was really that's actually another great show that I watched this year. Uh, but I don't think it came out this year. But because of our interest in Hamilton, we watched uh, that show called. John Adams, about the life of John, John Adams, and we really started thinking about the origins of America's history and uh, Alexander Hamilton's like contribution to all that, and the songs were just so great, and I just couldn't stop singing along to those songs, and I laughed and I cried. Uh, it's just a great piece of work, and I'm so glad that they put it on Disney Plus so more people can enjoy it, because it's really compelling. I think, even if you don't particularly like Hamilton, you might enjoy this. So uh, I would recommend watching Hamilton if you want to be in the mood to sing songs <laughs> for the next like couple months after watching this. If you haven't watched it, I think you'd really enjoy it. And then I watched the Hulu original film Palm Springs, which is like another genre bending story, another genre bending movie that was great. Uh, and I loved that both of the main characters were kind of these like anti-heroes that were deeply flawed but they grew to be more honest with themselves as the movie like progressed and uh, things changed and it's like the premise of the movie is like the never-ending day, right? Every, every, every day you keep waking up to the same day happening over and over and whether or not you're okay with that. And the other movies have done this before, notably the bit the, the most uh, pertinent, uh, obvious example is the movie Groundhog Day. So it's kind of like that, like every day these, these same characters keep waking up in the same day. And the trials and tribulations of working through this fate, what does it mean? What do we do? How do we make, how do we accept it? Blah, blah, blah. I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to give too much away, but it, it, it's another big thinker and really out of the at unexpected. Like it's very different, even though like this premise of this story of the never ending day, this has been done before. It hasn't ever been done this way. It's really different. Uh, and it's, it's also a rom-com. It's a romantic comedy, but it's so different. It's just, um, it's just a d different kind of movie in every way. Like, it, everything that you know about rom-coms and, and science fiction and, uh, the hero inside a movie and the happy movie ending and everything like that, this is just very different. And it's a big thinker and I, I, uh, recommend it. Everybody should check out Palm Springs. Really good movie. It's on Hulu. And the last movie that I saw, and it's probably the last movie that I did see anywhere, I th I'm planning on going to a drive-in at some point before the end of the month. There's a drive-in about an hour away from where I live that's pretty inexpensive, and I, I really want to see Wonder Woman, and I'm not ready to buy HBO Max yet, so um, I'm going to go check that out. But um, the last movie that I saw, it's another Hulu original. It's a movie called Bad Hair, and it's another like black horror movie. But this one is not directed by Jordan Peele. I believe it's a female director. I'm not quite sure. I'll have to look that up. But really gets under your skin. Real, the imagery is really makes your skin crawl. The story itself re is really engaging and enlightening. Like it honestly opened up to this new world for me. I didn't realize that uh, the culture around black hair is is so heavy. There's just so much to it 
there's so many expectations and and so much work and pain that goes into beauty i mean i'm a woman so I've experienced my own version of putting myself through pain in the name of beauty, but uh, for for black women and their hair and their relationship with their hair, I've always I also have had a bad relationship with my hair, but it's not like this. It's it's another big thinker. It's it really opened up my eyes to a lot of thing, a lot of aspects of black life, I guess you could say, that I didn't understand before. And it was genuinely scary, and it was genuinely like get on your skin, very dramatic, very um the visuals were just so good, and uh yeah, the cinematography, I guess that is what I'm, is the word I'm going for, and it was really compelling in like every way I, I really loved this movie i uh reawakening the horror genre as a whole um in such a new and exciting way but also in a way that kind of pays homage to the origins of horror as a genre as well. But it's just a little bit more in touch with the things that make us tick nowadays, which is what makes it so compelling, what makes it so scary. The same things that made us scared in the 80s and 90s are not the same things that are going to make us scared now, so we have to reimagine of what it means to be horror these days and uh, I think black filmmakers are really un understanding that in a in a profound way and you know I've always been a an enthusiast of horror and I'm so grateful that horror is coming back as a major theme in film. Whew, that was a lot of talking for just uh, music and TV and movies. Uh, so let's go ahead to start, let's go ahead and start talking about the parts of my 2020 favorites that were a little bit more heavy, <laughs> and I'm probably gonna even talk even more about these things. Uh, one of the first things that I did this year when I first moved to LA is I signed up to take classes at Cinema Makeup School. Uh, again, like uh, I retook some of the classes that I took. I started at the beginning of February and my classes lasted right up until the shutdowns from the pandemic and it was just so perfectly timed because it really, oh man, what is that, ex that experience was so incredible. What was what really made it so incredible, not only did I, um, you know, reawaken my passion for makeup and creating things and being a part of a team that is creating amazing art, uh, as you guys can tell, that I, I'm a big enthusiast of film and TV, and I, I moved to Los Angeles because I really want to be a lot more intertwined in this world. Being in a very creative environment where I'm creating things every single day, that is just so great. <laughs> um, it, it just made me feel full, made my heart feel full for those a month and a half. But not only was just the the artwork that I made, the artwork that I was so proud to make and just the exciting feeling of being a part of a bigger thing, like creating great art and great movies that make a difference. Yeah, with, or just making somebody look beautiful uh, and just helping them feel amazing, like help making people happy. Like what's better than that? In the end, that's what it is, right? That's what we're all trying to do is do something meaningful that's going to improve the world. It's gonna make the world a better place, right? And I felt that for sure, but I think the thing that really moved me, not only just being part of this creative environment and and pe being a part of this world, this world of film uh, filmmaking, like working with the other artists, just being in this community of people that have some many of the same passions and many of the same goals and they're from all around the world like my class of people they were all so talented and so open-minded and sometimes even vulnerable about uh their their hopes and dreams for the world and their lives and why they're here yeah they came from all around the world like they're in my class, we had a girl from Houston, girl from LA, girl from a different part of California, a girl from Vermont, uh, a guy from New York, but then we had a girl from Japan, a girl from Korea, a girl from China, um, a guy from Mexico, uh, one of my best friends that I made, a girl from Switzerland, um, a girl from Italy, a girl from Baltimore, of course. They had all these different styles, different uh, interests, but they all had a passion for film and they all had a passion for makeup. So that brought us 
all together. Every single one of them was so talented and so serious about their work too. And that's that was so admirable. It's just one of the greatest things that I did this year. I'll never take it back. It's one of the most incredible things I think I've ever done. Um, I've taken some classes in a makeup school before, but the class I took before is a lot smaller and just we weren't as close, you know? Uh, I think this class of, of people was much closer and very enthusiastic and very creative and I just love being at cinema makeup school and I even took, uh, I went to a bunch of seminars because uh, cinema makeup school holds, holds uh, seminars with uh, reputable makeup artists occasionally and they invite their alums to come see them speak and uh, Nicolette Scarlettos I saw twice. She is so inspiring to see and damn. I, I kind of put like makeup artistry on the back burner in recent months because of how hot COVID is in LA right now. Um, but you know, just remembering seeing her and, and the work that she did and she talked about makes me want to keep going, makes me want to still be part of all this. And so many of the teachers were just so inspiring and hardworking and one of the coolest things I think I did this year was take classes in cinema big school make, and meeting all those people and hearing all their stories and just uh, having a, like a relentless source of inspiration all around. So that was really great. And sadly, as soon as, like the day that I finished cinema makeup school, I remember the day, the last day of classes at Cinema Makeup School, we were doing our hairstyling finals, right? And we're, you know, we're brushing our hair dolls and we're blow drying and we're doing all the things. And I said, you guys, this is like a moment in history. And somebody like chuckled at me, laughed at me. She's like, a moment in history, what? And I'm just like, no, I'm serious. Like, we're gonna remember this. We're gonna be talking about this to our grandkids. We're gonna tell our grandkids kids about this one day. And uh, damn, did I not know how how right I was gonna be about that. Something else. But anyway, then a couple of weeks later the lockdowns happened and luckily I had just finished my coursework just in time. And I decided that since I'm gonna be quarantining and you know at first I was really kind of ready for a quarantine. Like at first I was really not panicked about everything because we were told initially that this is just gonna be like two weeks. Two weeks and we'll go all go back to normal. And unfortunately that's not what happened. We never really completely went back to normal. We're still not back to normal and that's too bad. Um, but in that time I was prepared because I was gonna uh, just do my taxes and clean my apartment because my apartment really got messy because of how much work I was doing and how often I was at cinema makeup school and I just had to clean my entire brush collection and I did all that and then I did my taxes. And then I took up a new hobby. Um, so I've been interested in skincare ingredients for a long time uh, and I've been getting more and more into it. And I figured now is the time I'm gonna start making my own skincare. And during quarantine, during the very beginning of quarantine, I started to experiment with that. So I started making all types of homemade skincare and that's been really fun for me because first of all, it just feels good to create something, uh, and especially something that's gonna really help people, help, and it helped me too, because you know, I go through a lot of skincare because my skin is really temperamental. I've got psoriasis, I've got eczema, I've got KP, I've got severely dry skin. So I go through a lot of body care products. So I started making body butters, body scrubs, and bath bombs, and those are just fun things to make. But I always found that when I would buy body products, they never had the, quite the ingredients that I wanted. Like, they'd have some of the ingredients that I wanted and I'd be okay with that, but they never had all the ingredients that I wanted. So now that I'm the master of my own fate, I started making concoctions that had all of my favorite ingredients. So I have this amazing salt scrub that I made that's really great for like eczema and psoriasis, oatmeal and honey body scrub that I made that is great for eczema and psoriasis. Um, and then I made a CBD bath bomb and a CBD muscle rub with Arnica. It's very hard to find like a lovely muscle rub that has Arnica and CBD in it. So that's what I use on my achy muscles. As a matter of fact, I think I'm gonna put some of that on my muscles tonight because over the weekend I went on a really intense hike. So um, my my muscles are still kind of recuperating from that, so a little CBD will probably help a lot. Uh, but I also, uh, rose is one of my favorite scents. I don't usually put 
scents in a lot of my products because I don't like scents in my products because they tend to irritate my skin, but in a product like a scrub that you rinse off, it's not so bad. Plus, I just love rose. Uh, I love the scent of rose and I was able to put rose petals into my sugar rose scrub as well as rose oil and rose hip oil and pure roses and rose water as well as shea and a bunch of different and kapawashi and a bunch of different butters that I think are amazing. Actually my rose scrub is probably my favorite thing but I also make a rose moisturizer and yeah I it's just been such an a, a incredible experience not only making these products and being the master of my own fate and the master uh, formulator behind my own products it's really done a wonders for my skin and just taking the time to just do this thing for myself like take care good care of my skin and give myself that really luscious moisture and that really luscious exfoliation to take care of myself and think about myself and taking care of myself in this way and loving myself in this way it's been uh, very good for me, all in all, and uh, I've, I've loved the whole experience. And if you guys are interested in my homemade bath products and skincare, check out my Etsy and my Poshmark. I sell my stuff there, so check that out. And I guess we're gonna go into the last thing I'm gonna talk about today. And it's the first thing that I did, but it's really been a pivotal part of how I have gotten through the year. So I guess I'm finally ready to start talking about the number one thing that I think has gotten me through this crazy, painful, difficult, challenging year. And it's moving to Los Angeles. And don't get me wrong, living in Los Angeles has had its challenges in its own right. But every day when I wake up, I just, I just feel grateful to be here. I've fallen even more deeply in love with the city. I mean, the reason I moved out here in the, in the first place is because I love this city so much. And even though the challenges that already faced it at the beginning of the year have gotten worse throughout the pandemic, I, I, I'm not ready to give up on it. I am not done loving it. Um, so I moved out to Los Angeles exactly a year ago today as I'm shooting this video, just January 19th. And uh, within days of me moving here, Kobe Bryant died, with like a few days after I moved here. And it really rocked the city when that happened. People were just so hurt and lost and it was just the, the beginning of the pain and heartbreak that the city would, would experience. But it was incredible to see the way that this city lives and breathes. Like, the Los Angeles is a epitome of a living city. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly adapting to whatever the world is. And it's always got its finger on the pulse of, as to what's going on in the world at large. I feel like it's unfair for Americans to try to distance themselves from California and Los Angeles as if the problems that we face here aren't their problems. Because guess what? The problems that LA faces are coming to a town near you soon. Like, LA's got some serious problems. It, it's got a exploding homeless population. It's always had a bad homeless population, but with COVID, it like just exploded this year. It's become a profitable political issue, and that's so sad about it. Like, I, I wish there was something that we could do that would work. And people have tried to do all bunch of different things, but every attempt at addressing this problem has been inefficient and lobbied against. And it's been a, a talking point that has allowed politicians to like c campaign over this issue. So it becomes profitable to keep this issue going so politicians can campaign against each other and collect donations over this issue as as they talk about what they're going to do about this issue they just the passion behind it, fixing this issue because it is so laid bare and exploding and so heartbreaking to watch that one of the richest cities in the, in the country and in the world has this abject poverty problem and you know as you think about these things you think about uh, another one of LA's big problems which is uh, wealth inequality, it's so laid out to bear here, but here's the thing. The way the politics around uh, the homelessness crisis in LA, I, I see versions of 
uh, the way our politics address that or let, don't address it playing out in different ways uh, to other issues around the country, you know? Whatever the big issue in your home state or in your home city is, politicians address it in a, sim in a similar way. Like, for instance, the health consequences that come out of um, uh, coal mining towns. So many people have emphysema and black lungs and cancer when they live in these coal mining towns and they work in these coal mines. But rather than, address, rather than addressing the problems that come along with that or even po offering up a, a different solution, like obviously you can't just flat out co close the coal mines down because then people are out of work, right? Uh, people still need to make a living. You know, rather than building new industries in those places or trying to offer up new resources to, to capitalize on in those cities, people just campaign against each other about these issues um, and it becomes more about connecting donations about the issue rather than addressing the issue itself, right? I just see this same play of politics happening all around the country. But I'm getting off, the, off on a tangent about the problems of, of LA and the problems of the politics at large in America and even beyond America. Like this happened, I think this is actually a bigger problem in America because of the way that we run our elections, the way that we campaign, and how long our campaigns are, and how much funding goes into these campaigns. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. I might have to cut all this part out, but, but you know, the fact that the LA is, has its finger on the pulse, whether they like to or not on this, these issues, uh, the, the, the first to experience it, makes me want to care for it so even more. Especially because even despite all the bad things that come with living in LA, there's just so much good things. There's so much culture. It's such a living, breathing city. Anyth anytime anything happens, the culture kind of swirls around that thing. For instance, when Kobe died, Everybody came out in droves and started watching way more basketball than they ever did before. Murals of Kobe sprung up all around the city, almost overnight. You could just see it in their eyes. You could just see that their heart was broken over losing Kobe. All the buses had rest in peace Kobe uh, like written on them and like uh, billboards had rest in peace Kobe written on them. For, for a long time, for weeks, months even. To this day, you can even see those murals all around the city too. So many of them are so beautiful. Uh, I started to observe this too. Like, uh, street art is one of the things that I, I really start to notice. First Kobe died, and then the pandemic happened, and we started to see artwork and murals, and that look in people's eyes as they were thinking about what this meant for their lives and they, uh, as they cared for um, essential workers and as everybody was making all these sacrifices uh, there was just a sense of community you could just kind of feel it in the air people just adapting to this wrench that had been thrown at their lives and in every single possible way like also I, I saw artwork and murals and billboards all around the city commemorating essential workers and medical workers. Uh, outside this window right here, I have a beautiful view of uh, downtown LA. I, it's dark out now, so you probably won't be able to see, but there's a tower, uh, the, a very prominent tower in downtown LA. Uh, when Kobe died, it was lit up purple and gold. And during the pandemic, the early days of the pandemic, it was blue and white and said thank you at the top to commem commemorate essential workers and medical workers. Or uh, then George Floyd died and the entire city just erupted in activism. And not just uh, about Black Lives Matter, but also other forms of activism really kind of sprung up out of the moment as well. And I see activism happening all around the city all the time but this was just on another level. Every part of the city, because LA is not just one city, it's like a, a group of a lot of huge cities. It's just all these cities just squished together, right? So you would see demonstrations and marches and parades happening in downtown LA and Glendale and Echo Park and Silver Lake and Venice Beach and Santa Monica and Hollywood, West Hollywood. Uh, Brentwood, Westwood, North Hollywood, like every city 
Every city was holding demonstrations and it was just beautiful to behold because the truth is if you were really out there experiencing the world you would know that the vast majority were not only very peaceful of these protests but they were very beautiful. Just the sense of camaraderie, especially in downtown LA. You would see members of the LGBTQ plus community marching with Black Lives Matter and all their allies and all the climate allies because many of these issues are intertwined, right? The BIPOC community as well as the LGBTQ plus community have had their own experiences of police brutality and mistreatment. Um, and women too. Women were marching along as, uh, as well. You know, I, must, I myself have experienced sexual harassment from the police. And I know I'm not alone. I know plenty of other women have experienced something of that nature as well. And then that's not to say that all cops are bad, but we do have to be honest about this problem, right? There is a problem. And you know, the Black Lives Matter movement isn't new. It's been going, around, going on since what? When everything was first erupting, the first thing I thought of was Rodney King. Uh, and what happened to LA and Rodney, when Rodney King was, um, it was just an echo of that history and of, of that pain, right? It was, you know, LA did not take the hit that it did back during the Rodney King riots. But uh, the demonstrations that I saw around the city, I found to be mostly really inspiring. Yes, there was some violence and some looting, but for the most part, it was dancing and live music and uh, violin vigils and candlelight vigils and parades and marches uh, of different communities marching together, allies all marching together in unity as a, a sign of compassion and camaraderie and, and that made me feel really hopeful and really made me believe in this city as well as and this is really hard to talk about because of uh, what happened, what ha the, the events of January, right? But I still believe in this country, in this city, especially because I know that in our history, these things have happened to us before and we can get through it again. And this time come out even stronger, stronger than ever before. And I want to be able to do whatever I can to keep fighting for the city and the country that I've grown to love. And I think that the power of love from my own heart that I've discovered this year, as well as out of the sense of community and com camaraderie as being a part of this city and this country this year is stronger than I could ever imagine. We've confronted all types of difficult challenges in this country. You know, traumatic things have happened to this country time and time again. And you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about history because of the things that have happened this year. Like other economic recessions and depressions that we've had before and other uh, civil rights movements that we've had before and other pandemics that we've had before. This has all been, I have hope in the fact that we've worked through these things before and we're working through them now. And it's sometimes hard, through the noise, it's hard to see some of the hard work and the and beauty that has come and love that has come out of this year and in our history as a whole. And that makes me hopeful that we will get through it all and be stronger than we ever were before. Become a lot closer to the equality and justice for all. This country and this life promises. Okay, I think I've uh, gotten a hold of myself there. Um, I love, love in the city and I believe in it. And because of all the love that I saw, I really do believe that there's more love and hope uh, than there is hate and futility out in the world. You know, things probably felt really hopeless, hopeless in some of these other instances, instances in our history where we uh, experienced similar things. You know, if people got through it back then, we can get through it again. With uh, all the beautiful art that sprung up during throughout the city and throughout the country, because in July I drove out to Massachusetts and then in uh, September I drove back to California, so I saw a lot of the country this year. As well as in January I drove out to LA with my little uh, 
trailer on my hatchback. <laughs> so I just was able to see artwork and demonstrations just kind of spring up all around the city. And there was tension and hate in some parts of the country, admittedly. But there was also love and compassion all throughout the country as well. And art, lots of beautiful art everywhere. And, you know, making art is always a good outlet. It was a good outlet for me as a child, uh, as an angsty teen, and it's a good outlet now. <laughs> create, just create something. If you're feeling fucked up, create something. If it helps you not, uh, not stew in your anger, which is a bad thing to do. It's something that I've been trying to like work on myself. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot to be sad and angry and frustrated about this year. Focusing on art has helped me fo feel better about it all and focusing on the things that I love about the world, such as art and community and and traveling and the world and cities and the natural landscape. Yeah, na nature itself. I bought a national parks pass. That's been another favorite this year. I saw so many national parks this year. It's another thing that really made me deep into my love for America and all its problems and all its flaws working through right now. Um, and it's really difficult, but I can see it persevering. I, I see, I see once we handle all this, we'll be better than ever. But I'm not even done talking about LA yet. Uh, soon, uh, after I came back from Massachusetts uh, in September, um, the Lakers just kept w winning, which was so... It was making the whole city so happy. Everybody was celebrating Kobe again because, you know, we had lost Kobe and that was so uh, traumatizing and heartbreaking for the city to experience. But there was a little bit of retribution and a little bit of healing that happened. When the Lakers just kept winning, they won so many times. Like they really like did an amazing job winning. And the Dodgers won the World Series. That was such an incredible moment for LA. Um, especially because when the Dodger Dodgers won, uh, LA was starting to be a bad hotspot. So things were starting to shut down again. So right in time for shutdowns to start sweeping the city yet again. Uh, the J Dodgers won and there was celebration and everybody was wearing their Dodgers jerseys and uh, I, I had kept hearing that song I Love LA on the radio over and over and over and I, I didn't hate it. I actually loved hearing that song so many times. And murals of the Dodgers popped up all over the city. More art. <laughs> more joy. And it was sad, you know, throughout the year you saw different businesses close down and open back up and then close down again and open back up and then close down for good. Um, but maybe new businesses and new enterprises and new solutions to the city's problems evolved out of that and everything just keeps changing all the time and, you know, I think that's why LA is such a progressive place. It's, it's because it's us a city that is no stranger to change. It's um, it's one of its strengths and also its weaknesses. It adapts to change very quickly. People are very, you know, that requires an open mind. You, you can't be scared of change because it's inevitably going to happen. So it's best to just kind of embrace it and accept it for what it is and look at it as an opportunity. And I think that's what people in LA always do. You know, out of all the challenges that have faced me throughout the year, I feel like a lot of them I have looked at as an opportunity, you know. Uh, the shutdowns that came with COVID really hurt me because it meant that I couldn't keep doing as much makeup um, and really had to put like face painting aside and doing events aside. You know, I love being an event artist um, and doing makeup for film, obviously. It's the whole reason I moved out to LA. But, it, but you know, the, the step back I had, I experienced with the shutdowns from COVID, I took up a new hobby. I spent a lot of time self-reflecting and thinking about the things that I really care about and the things that I'm really passionate about. And that has deepened my love for all the many things that I love in my life. I don't know if it's come across in this video whatsoever, but uh, I love a lot of things. <laughs> I'm a pretty emotional person, and I've always been passionate about a lot of things. 
And it's something about, I'm really proud of. The fact that I care about these things, I think is a good thing. I've learned to be a lot more honest with myself and love myself. Realize that it's actually kind of harder to love yourself than it is to love other people sometimes. And loving yourself means honest, being honest with yourself about the things that you need to work on. Um, and loving your city and your country also means being honest with the things that you need to work on. <laughs> So many of the cold, hard, raw traumas of the year and the hard and painful confrontation of truths that we've all had to face this year, it's really made me become a lot closer to so many of the people that I care about in my life. It's made me really realize how much I value so many of my friends and my family. What I mean to say is that through all the pain and the challenges and the hardship and everything that the year has thrown at us, I feel like through dealing with all that, it's made me a more loving, more appreciative, open, honest, compassionate person. And I feel like I had many of those qualities before, but like now it's like the priority, right? And for that, I'm grateful. It seems cheesy and obvious, but I think the adversity really did. All the challenges did make me stronger and better. And I look forward to taking on all the things that I've learned from 2020 into 2021. And there's just like no way that I, it can't be a better year, even though traumatic shit keeps happening to all our lives anyway. Yeah, as long as we just don't give up working hard and caring for one another and caring for ourselves. It's going to be good. I have so much gratitude for the relationships I've forged, the people in my life, how much closer I've become to my friends and family, to myself, to my city, to my country. There are profound things and it's easy to be grateful for them. Even though I'm really sad that my cruise gig got canceled this year. I was supposed to go to Belize. I was sad about that. <laughs> and uh, I spent a lot of time kind of crying on, on New Year's Eve and throughout the holidays because I was alone. I spent all that time alone because you're, uh, the city of LA was kind of begging people to, to not gather for the holidays. And I wanted to do my part, but it was incredibly lonely, especially after reflecting of all the traumas of the year. I also lost my grandmother. And I'm not gonna start talking to that because I'm gonna ugly cry if I do. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. 2020 was a profound, transitional, challenging, heartbreaking, um, traumatic year for everyone, I think. But a lot of beauty, I think, was wrought from the pain. And even though it seems like I can't keep myself from erupting into tears, <laughs> I do feel like I feel a lot stronger than I ever was before. And I hope you are too. So I think that is it guys. That is my 2020 favorites. <laughs> I think I, there's a lot more I could probably talk about, but um, I think I've said enough. Let me know down in the comments some challenges that you've faced this year and what you learned from those challenges. How the things that you've learned you feel like could potentially make 2021 a better year. How those overcoming those challenges have made you stronger. Because I feel like everybody might have a version of such a story to share. And I think that could be really valuable. And I hope has inspired some of you guys to uh, think about the things that you're grateful for in your life because a little gratitude can go a long way, I think. Speaking of gratitude, thank you so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me. I really enjoyed hanging out with you, and until next time, cheers. Bye!